from Built It Productions, it's The Great Creators. Conversations about creativity with some of the most celebrated actors, musicians, and performers of our time. I'm Guy Raz, and on the show today, Jeff Tweedy, the singer and guitarist for the iconic alt-rock band Wilco. I think Yankee Hotel Foxtrot ended up being what it is because there were so many wrong turns. It's It ended up in so many other places than where I wanted it to go <laughs> that eventually it ended up somewhere where I was able to look around and go, wow, I've never been here before. I don't know what this is. Let's share this. Jeff Tweedy is a giant of indie rock. In 2002, his band Wilco released the album Yankee Hotel Foxtrot, and it was, and still is, massively influential. It's not an understatement to say that it was kind of like an indie rock version of Pet Sounds, full of atmospheric sound effects and multiple layers of musical styles. But even before Wilco's success, Jeff was a pioneer of a whole new genre that became known as alt-country. That was in a band called Uncle Tupelo that he formed with Jay Farrar, who was the lead singer. As you'll hear in our conversation, Jay abruptly dissolved Uncle Tupelo in 1994 at the height of its popularity. Jeff Tweedy would have to prove himself worthy of being a frontman. And that's when Wilco was formed. On this episode of the show, you'll hear about Jeff's reaction to that devastating split. He actually didn't see it coming. And how it forced him to expand into new musical territories, kind of as a way to avoid overlapping with the sound of Jay's new band, Sunvolt. You'll also hear how that search led him to incorporate influences far from roots and country, influences like Stravinsky. And Jeff will explain how he turns off his own internal critic to be able to experiment with new sounds. That's all coming up after this short break. Jeff Tweedy grew up in the small town of Belleville, Illinois, across the Mississippi River from St. Louis. His dad worked for the railroad and his mom worked as a kitchen designer. In his memoir, Jeff's written about how he finds it easier to connect with women, something he traces back to his relationship with his mom. I think in psychological parlance, I would be referred to as an uncontested Oedipal victor. I think my mother uh, looked at me more as a companion yeah. than a, a young child. I think she had a difficult time making healthy boundaries in terms of the amount of emotional reliance she might have p- placed on me yeah. uh, for her happiness. But yeah, she my, my world definitely centered around my mother as a young child. And my father was kept, kept at a distance. And you were the youngest, right? I was the youngest by 10 years, sort of a only child in effect because, you know, by the time I really have memories, my siblings were out of the house and at college or had just left. You yeah. Know? Um, you described your parents as both – both your parents were, were high school dropouts. Your dad, I think, worked on uh, – he worked in the railroads. Um, but you just you've described them as both highly intelligent. Um, what when did you kind of realize? I mean, they were not formally educated, but clearly, you saw you understood that they were both really smart. Well, I mean, when you're you're a little kid, your parents seem really smart, right. no matter what. So, um, I never I never thought they were dumb. They're both autodidacts. You know, they had both managed to teach themselves. Uh, pretty complicated sets of skills to, you know, make a living. My mother taught herself drafting hmm. um, and was able to design kitchens and draw them in three-point perspective and uh, beca- became a kitchen cabinet designer and and sold bathrooms and fixtures and things like that. She was really good at it. And my dad... Uh, taught himself how to fix televisions, taught himself how to work on all kinds of different electronics. And then uh, at some point working on the railroad, they identified him as being 
I guess, not a dummy, you know, yeah. and, and and gave him the opportunity of learning how to program computers with punch cards. And so he had been he sent to a program in a, in Arizona in the early 60s. So he hmm. they uh, so by the time I came around, they both they had skill sets that were evident that weren't. You know, it was surprising to me to find out that they had dropped out of high school. Yeah. You know, they seemed they seemed uh, very accomplished. Jeff, I wonder um, about music in, in your house. I've read and you've written about um, people like Glenn Campbell and, and Johnny Cash, you know, Carl Perkins, you know, the music that you that you would listen that be played at home. Um but was was anyone in your in at home like musical? Did anybody play instruments? Uh, no, my mother said she wanted to be a singer, but I never really heard her sing very hmm. much. <laughs> and um, my dad, I think, in another time, another place, different set of circumstances, was maybe a born entertainer. Yeah, he was um, very funny, and he he aspired to be able to play an instrument, but he never he never learned how to play an instrument. He his brothers. All played instruments. You know, my uncles and my cousins all played guitars and harmonicas and things like that. So that was my my main exposure early on, our first exposure to being around somebody playing an instrument would be my uncles or my, my cousins. Um, would you describe yourself as a quiet kid or shy? I think I have elements of shyness. I think that I was... I was taught to be pretty comfortable with uh, solitude, I think, or with, uh, you know, it was it was a part of my mother's philosophy, <laughs> you know. She, I think, had developed a real fear of abandonment through her upbringing that formed in a, you know, a very strong opinion that you're born alone and you die alone, so she, wow. you should get used to being alone. <laughs> And, and um, you know, so if I was lonely or expressed loneliness, it wasn't, well, why don't you call so-and-so down the street and right. have him come over and play? It was literally my mother taught me how to play solitaire. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but who's to say? I mean, there's also nature. Uh, uh, my nature, I think, responded well to that. I think yeah. I do – tend to enjoy solitary pursuits like reading or listening and very curious yeah. about the world. So well, when you um you took up the guitar, I mean I know you got you got a guitar at like six, but you really didn't start playing around with it until you were about twelve. Um mm -hmm. did you take to the guitar right away? Did, did was it something that you were like what when you start really started playing around with it? Was it like, I really want to learn this. I want to get good at this. No, initially the guitar that I when I was six, I think it was such a poorly made instrument, and it would hurt so badly to p try and press On your the strings. Fingers, down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, as a little kid, that was one of those guitars with the strings that are really high off the fretboard, mm -hmm. and it was punishing um, to try and play. Uh, but when I when I, I mean. By the time I lo I learned how to play the guitar, I had already identified myself as a guitar player hmm. or as a musician. I like I had I had formed my identity around the idea that that I was a, I was a songwriter, I was a musician. The only thing left to do was to actually learn how to play the guitar. <laughs> what was it? Were you comfortable? I mean, given that you were kind of raised in this with this idea of self sufficiency or solitude, let's say. Um, were you comfortable with the idea of like singing in front of other people? My some of my first experiences on stage were, I feel like I had, had some sort of armor or something. I think maybe the guitar felt like a a shield. Of, yeah. I, I like in hindsight, I would even immediately after I would feel like I had lost my mind a little <laughs> bit. You know, I think there's a. Yeah, um, it was, I don't know if I would call myself a ham, but it was a certain fearlessness to that form of expression. That you know. that when the guitar, when you were holding the guitar, it sort of protected you, Jeff Tweedy, from any opprobrium or judgment. That that the guitar was like, as you say, a shield. Yeah, I think I think so. I think also just it was 
a part of the self liberation, you know, that this idea that I had formed around, you know, listening to other people's records and closing my eyes and projecting myself into that role. I I think I was emulating what I thought you're supposed to do uh, on on stage or, you know, like uh, there's a certain amount of hero emulation. In in that town where you grew up in Belleville. Um, you you were like getting into pretty sort of sophisticated bands for a young kid, like The Clash and The Ramones, Sex Pistols, The Replacements. Um, mm-hmm. How did you discover that music at that time? I mean, this is not you know pre-internet, pre-zines. I mean, they were glossy rock mags, but you know, you were in a small town outside of St. Louis. How did you how did you get exposed to that music? There are a few cosmic coincidences, I think, or, you know, just uh, small miracles of proximity and luck. You know, Belleville, for all of its provincial kind of nature, had a record store near my house that was extremely adventurous in its, uh, you know, what it would stock. Yeah. Aside from that, I had inherited a pretty crazy record collection from my brother, who was my older brother, who I, mean, I had two older brothers, but my oldest older brother, you know, saved me from the indignity of joining a record club at some <laughs> point when I was a kid for 13 records yeah. for a penny um, by just saying, here, you can take my records. And at that point, he had amassed this what would have been at the time college music, I guess, you know, the types of records that, have, that, that someone in college that had an adventurous taste in um, records would have accumulated. And, and it was, you know, to this day, it's a pretty hip collection. Hmm. Just if I'm just looking at the records that have SKT on them, which in my collection, those are my brothers. Yeah. It's like... Aphrodite's Child, Amandul, Kraftwerk. Wow. Uh, just a wild hodgepodge of European experimental music and prog rock and things like that. So I didn't know any better. I thought those records are records. And yeah. um, I, I, I listened to a lot of those alongside my sister's and my aunt's Monkey's records mm. and Beatles records and Bird's records. And so it all... It all it all started. I mean, I think I still draw upon that basic pool. Yeah, you know, as wide as it might be, it gave me a lot of latitude to think about records in in those in a you know pretty liberal way. Um, a lot's been been written about your your meeting with Jay Farrar, fourteen years old. You met in high school, and you would of course go on to form Uncle Tupelo, which we'll talk about in a moment. But um, did you, by that point, by the time you met him when you were 14, think that you were going to be in a band? Like, that's what you were going to do? That was your sort of, I don't know, dream or vision or goal? Yeah, I didn't. I don't think I had any concept of how that happens. Yeah. But, but I definitely saw myself as being around music, wanting to be a part of the world of music whatever that meant, being a DJ, working in a record store. I mean, I could not listen to le- records without picturing myself being on stage. Hmm. Being empowered in that way, I think at the time, there was an element of revenge to it. <laughs> revenge? Well, it's just that, um, you know, the people that would hassle me for being a little different I guess I wasn't like I wasn't like a sore thumb I fit in in a lot of ways but I also didn't fit in in a a lot of ways that were alienating Um, you know there's a there's an anti-intellectualism to a small town like that 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 can be pretty painful there's a there's a narrow set of parameters for the way you dress and you know just self-expression that you could feel even if you weren't even testing the boundaries of them. Uh, I don't know, for whatever reason, I felt alienated. And and listening to The Clash and picturing myself being in a situation like that where I was the one on stage singing those songs, singing 
with that energy, I I really do think there was like a revenge fantasy component to it that hmm. it would that it would put people in their place and um, vanquish my foes <laughs> or or erase their their small minds or something yeah. you know like it never worked out like that it's, it's just it's a it's a really poor strategy for revenge being in a band it actually opens you up to more ridicule and scorn i found out pretty quickly <laughs> um did you find in Jay when you were 14 a soulmate? I mean, here was a kid who was also, I think, a little bit of an oddball in the sense of what he listened to and what he was into. And um, did you right away connect with him over over that? Absolutely connected immediately over music. Uh, our modes of communication – Never felt completely comfortable. Just, uh, how so? Well, I mean, I don't know if you've ever met Jay or talked to Jay, but I think he has. Um, he, he's he's ill at ease. I think, in, in, in he, and he was always a little bit ill at ease. And and, and uh, there's a there was an intensity to our relationship. Yeah. Uh, that um, we needed each other, and we were the only people that we could discuss certain things with uh, for each of us in terms of music and and what we cared about. And um, there was a you know a deep friendship formed, but I wouldn't describe it in the way that you would most likely describe most of your close friends, right. where you feel so comfortable and yeah. you. You know, you don't. You're not afraid of saying anything wrong yeah. because you're never gonna say anything wrong. You're always gonna be given the benefit of the doubt. I never achieved that kind of ease around Jay in my whole life. I never did. You know, yeah. It, but he definitely was a huge part of my life. Um, I I think other people did, and I I, mean, I don't haven't seen Jay in such a long time. I'm yeah. assuming he probably, you know softened uh, quite a bit at some point but i i didn't experience it I, i'm i'm blown away by something that you 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 said or you sort of in in recalling this part moment in your life sort of high school end of high school um because you'd been in a couple of high school bands which actually with jay's brothers but um basically you work at a record store um after high school mm -hmm. and you were not very good as a record store employee um, not 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 a bad attitude. You just weren't very competent in, in in the way you describe it. And what you said, uh, recalling that time, was that I just always knew I was going to be a musician. Like I, I, I had no doubt that that was going to happen. What did that What did that actually mean in practical terms? Did you think that you were going to make a living off being a musician? Like you had, you were sure that this was going to happen. You were so confident there was just no other path. No, I I think by the time I got to be 16 or 17 years old, I had seen punk rock bands and I'd seen in independent rock bands come through St. Louis and, you know, been able to witness firsthand, at least observe this lifestyle that looked attainable. And by the know? way, who are you? Who do you remember seeing? Like the Minutemen, bands like that or... Minutemen, Husker Du, Black Flag, mm -hmm. Minute, uh, Meat Puppets, mm -hmm. you know, countless bands. Yeah. Uh, just um, as much, as often, as, as frequently as possible. Um, just try and find wow. something to see. And, you know, we, being from Belleville, uh, we go early, you know, we'll just make sure we get over the bridge in <laughs> St. Louis and figure out what to do from there and just hang out by the Mississippi because a lot of the shows would be at a this club called Mississippi Nights, which is right on the river, and um, hang out by the arch and wait around. And so you'd get to see them pull into town sometimes and see their van and see them get out and look pretty normal and look like us, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. it just seemed plausible. When we come back after a quick break, Jeff and Jay take a punk approach and apply it to Roots music and create what will eventually be called alt-country. Stay with us. 
I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to The Great Creators. Hey, welcome back to The Great Creators. I'm Guy Raz. Here's more of my conversation with Jeff Tweedy. As you sort of began to form um, a band, I'm just curious. I mean, here you are. You're this guy who kind of grew up almost being trained to focus on solitude and self-sufficiency and self-reliance. And I've read so much about how you just loved being around other people in a band. Like, because a band is about collaboration. It's about groups. Like, and not everyone can do that. Not everyone can work in a group. Like, there are really smart people who are just better mm. working on their own, whether they're artists or mm. in business or whatever. But you somehow were attracted to being around other people and, like, jamming together and figuring stuff out together. W- where did that come from, that that attraction to that kind of collaboration? Well, first of all, I want to point out that self-sufficiency, in my case, does not, um, should not imply to anyone that I'm very good at taking care of myself right. uh, in a self-sufficient <laughs> way. Right. Uh, it's more about an emotional self-sufficiency yeah. or a, you know, like I don't get bored. I get yeah. like you know, there's like, and I, I can occupy my mind. Um, but um, I don't want to sound like I can build a house out in the woods by myself <laughs> or something, right. you know. Right. Um, but um, you know, other people. I did. I didn't dislike being around other people. What I disliked was being around other people that weren't as obsessed with a specific narrow set of things to talk about as <laughs> as as I wanted to talk about. And and so um in my mind, a band, say the monkeys or the the Beatles in help, the whole concept of it was like, oh, you find your group of people right. and and then you get to talk about all of this stuff and 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 they're willing to do it with you. They're willing to to entertain the same exact set of topics <laughs> and are all uh, all all up for it, you know. And it's not just it's not just talking about music. It's not just talking about records or it's like uh, I pictured it as being like, oh, these are. These are vulnerable guys. These are mm. guys that are willing to talk about their feelings, or yeah. these like you know, there was like an artistic collective. And I you were never... looking for that. I just, I didn't understand why it didn't. I, I didn't see it anywhere else. I thought that that was, you know, I don't know where else you. I mean, sports. There's a a certain level of that. There's a certain level of camaraderie and and uh, a sense that you're, you know. You belong somewhere. Yeah. But there's also almost a demand that you conceal vulnerability in those environments compared to uh, what I thought music was like. And you wanted that. You wanted to be a part of a group of guys that that could connect on that level. Yeah. I mean – you know, a good example of that is like Jay, Jay Farrar and I would go to parties. We had a couple of other friends that would go with us, and we'd always end up in a room by ourselves <laughs> listening to records. <laughs> you know? I'm laughing because I completely relate. But, yeah, you were – and and that's what you would do. You would sort of go to a room and just, you know, the party was going on. But mm-hmm. it was kind of – like yeah. I, I mean, it's still to this day I kind of don't understand it. I don't understand – like I, it blows my mind when I drive by, say, a club downtown Chicago that has a line wrapped around the the, the block of people waiting to get in to go. I mean, that type of of uh, entertainment or activity, I I guess I understand it intellectually, uh, what it's about, you know, maybe, but it doesn't appeal to me at all and it's it's very difficult for me to understand what the appeal would be. Yeah. You you were not able to engage in small talk and probably still aren't able to do it today easily. Um I think I'm much better at it today but um but it's not uh it's not effortless. Yeah. I mean you have to be Jeff Tweedy too because so many today millions of people 
know you and love your music and you mean so much to them. And so sometimes you have to be, obviously the, you're the same person, but you have to be that best version of yourself sometimes. And it means that you have to do those things. Well, I, I always try and be honest and kind as much as I possibly can. And I, I, I know that I fall short all of the time because I'm easily distracted. Um, for example, if I meet a group of people after the show and I want to give each one of them my undivided attention, totally. but when other people are looking at me, I I notice them. I can't I, – I have a really difficult time. You know, one-on-one, -on -one I can do a much better job, but when there's um, uh, a scenario like that, I just – I know that I'm, I'm not – I'm never going to give everybody what they – what they want, you yeah. know, what they expect. Um, so sometimes I just, I'm honest. I just say I, I, I'm really overwhelmed by all you guys. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I just try and tell people like, like um, but um, it's not hard to be kind, and it's, and it is, it's, it's much easier when I'm able to remember that that most ninety nine point nine percent of the people are coming. To you with with so much goodwill and yeah. you know to to meet you and say hi and often just say thanks for making making your music making my music. I wonder going back to Uncle Tupelo. I wonder when you got on stage, right? Because you are quiet. I mean, you, we can tell here. I mean, you and and I've seen you in interviews, and you are a quiet by nature you know, almost self-effacing person, but on stage you bring this charisma, like you are, it's almost like you transform into not a different person, but, but the person you need to be on stage. Was that part of the appeal to you when, when you started performing on stage? Um, I really, I really don't, I mean, I don't know. Some part of it, uh, some part of getting on stage is, is it, at one point my life was very painful, the, the process of getting myself to the stage. Just the panic, um, just the fear. The fear of it, the panic of um, uh, falling apart in front of people because I felt so untethered or, you know, yeah. like uh, fragile in terms of how well I was put together. But in general, the I, I think for most of my life, music would be a conflict-free zone compared to other areas of my life, and and then you know I've just accumulated so much experience up there where it, it is, you know, it is one of the places when I am in it completely that I feel the most comfortable in my life. So it's a weird. It's a weird place to feel comfortable, but uh, but I do. Yeah. How do you help me understand how Uncle Tupelo? I mean, Uncle Tupelo was described and is described as alt country, and yet, and I know that was a big part of what you listened to. But you were also like into punk, and a lot of the aesthetic, a lot of the approach that Uncle Tupelo took, came from punk. This even this like, the way you recorded music, like. It, it, you didn't. You guys didn't want to fuss with it. You didn't want to do multiple takes. It had to be authentic. It had to just be like laid down and like the Minutemen mm -hmm. would record. But yet, you were described as an all country, and you 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 had that sound. So, how did that how did that sound develop? I mean, how did you you all or you and Jay kind of land on that sound? Well, I mean, I think alt country really didn't exist yeah. when we. Formed. I mean, we didn't listen to alt country because we would have never known what that was. Right. We, um, at some point, just through our record buying habits, made some connection between folk music and and country music as having the same level of authenticity as punk rock to us. Hmm. And the same thing with soul music. It was all music that was saying, "I deserve to be here." I yeah. don't care what you say. I have liberated myself to be able to say what I want to say, and I, I do not need to adhere to your parameters, whoever you are, they are, like 
um, all of that music really resonated in the same way in our minds. And we wanted a part of that. And, and uh, to us, there were bands like the Meat Puppets were playing songs that sounded like country music, the, the country influences. Replacements had country influences. Mm -hmm. The Rolling sure. Stones had country influences. Yeah. The Beatles had country influences. It wasn't some color that wasn't on the palette to us. It was just, um, just something about our how we mix those ingredients that sounded like something maybe uh, different to yeah. other people. But to us, it was like it was the same ingredients as all of our favorite music. Well, one of the things that, that I, I want to try to figure out in, in this conversation is how, you know, well, in, in, in conversation, how somebody goes from, from this point to where they are now. And that's obviously – it's a natural progression. We evolve over time and, and our, our, our tastes, our art, whatever it is we do changes and it evolves and gets better. Um, and, and one of the you know best known songs from Uncle Tupelo, New Madrid, which I think you still occasionally perform live, um, it's, it's so different from what would come later. And then, of course, there are elements of, of your latest release that hark back to that. But mm -hmm. um, it's this jaunty country song, basically. And I, I'm kind of oversimplifying it, but... Um, you you wrote that song. It's about parts of it are about the um, the New Madrid earthquakes of the 19th century, um, big huge earthquake, um, mm -hmm. and but it's this sort of daydream song. What do you remember about about writing that song, and what what do you remember trying to or wanting to say in that song? You know, at the time there was a prediction that there was going to be a er, another yes. earthquake very yes, similar to, yeah. to the to the one that made the Mississippi River roll backwards. And so it was really fascinating to me that it created such a international stir in our neck of the woods, even though it wasn't Belleville. It was a town similar to Belleville, maybe a little bit smaller. And for whatever reason, it just, it wasn't so much writing about the earthquake or the disaster. It was writing about the the human disaster of of uh, all these news trucks rolling in, and I, you know it's like it's just I, like any song. It just kind of I can't really describe it other than it just I discovered it yeah. by by thinking about well what happens when say this news reporter what do they what happens when the cameras go off do they go to a bar in, in new madrid illinois or new madrid missouri i'm sorry do they fall in love <laughs> do they hang out and and um and so that's what i was trying to to figure out is like there's these tectonic plates moving against each other under mm. under under the ground, but it seemed like people coming from the media centers of our country to a place like New Madrid were sort of similar tectonic plates rubbing against each other. These people don't un understand each other. Does that answer your question? Yeah, <laughs> and, 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 and I'm also betraying my 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 West Coast um, sensibility and accent by pronouncing it like Madrid in Spain. But pronounced yeah. New Madrid. Um, do you? Yeah. Do That's you? On the, well, I think that was probably the initial idea for the song was just that that I wanted to sing New Madrid because it was that was like such a thing to <laughs> contemplate with yeah. many many names in our region. You yeah. Know? Yeah. When, when when you guys started out as Uncle Tupelo in 1987, I mean, it, you, you you know, pretty quickly, I mean, I know it probably didn't feel like it was fast because you were touring and grinding away and playing in clubs in Chicago and actually you met your wife in, in, in a club and I think in Chicago. You found like an audience, an indie audience or what, what wasn't called indie then, I think it's still called college rock then. Um, you know, you found an audience and you guys were getting some attention, you know, within a year or two of forming um, and even some press. Do you do you remember thinking, wow, this is this is pretty great. You know, this is like we are we're, we're making it or did it did it feel more like, God, we're going nowhere? I don't I'm trying to what do, what do you remember about that time? Oh, I think every step of the way from when we first were able to start having a reliably sold out audience at a small club in St. Louis show yeah. up, I think I've outlived my dreams 
by about 30 years. Wow. <laughs> you know, because I think that those, uh, when those things started happening for real, like we had a van, we had the potential to make a record, it was, seemed like just on the horizon. And we were traveling around playing shows. And when we would show up in town, uh, the local college radio station will have heard of us and played some of our music possibly. And, and people were showing up in Iowa City and, and Columbia, Missouri and places like that. Uh, I, I mean, I honestly can say I remember feeling like this is all I have ever dreamed of. This wow. is this is exactly how I wanted my life to go. It was great. It, I do. I still think it's great. I think if it, that's all that had ever happened to me in my life, I would think it's it was great. And and um, if it's what happens at some point in the future in my life, I will still think it's great. It's a great great thing to do to get in a van and go play music for people. Um, from what I've read, right, there there were differences, right? There there, uh, there were creative differences. Um, the I mean, some members of the band, you included, wanted to evolve the sound to try different things out. And and there were differences over what that meant, right? I mean, and ultimately there were there was tension in the band. We we know we know many people who are fans of Uncle Tupelo, you know, know the story. Jay Jay Farrar basically announced that the band was breaking up, and he announced it was going to split up, and, and, and you continued to tour for a while after. But, I mean, this this kind of caught you off guard. You found out about it because he announced it. Creative dis differences, I, I did not honestly perceive that. I thought that we, we made decisions. There was a certain amount of, of uh, friction uh, in the band more based on how willing we were going to be to adapt to having more fans. It yeah. wasn't so much about the creative aspect of the music growing or whatever. I mean, Uncle Tupelo did kind of evolve pretty drastically from the first record to the fourth record. And yeah. that was that was pretty healthy creative alliance that allowed that to happen um but um to answer your question when jay announced that he was quitting it really did shock me it surprised me because it, i did was still under the impression that things were better than ever yeah <laughs> i thought i thought this is as good as it gets yeah i mean it's 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 interesting because when you sort of think back on these painful moments or if it's a failure or a setback which seems disastrous at the time, like without that, without that happening, your career would not have become what it became. Like in some ways, it was like a blessing that that that, that happened. Absolutely, I mean it's it's it is what happened, and like when in with any setback in any one's life. You know, this is going to sound like a greeting card or something, you know, like, but a door closes and you have to look for the door that opens. Yeah. You know, it's like, a, um, and thankfully, I was adept at, at doing that. I was not easily dissuaded from my, my desire to do what I was doing. And um, it was... You know, it just uh, it 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 hurt me, and uh, I remember. I mean, I really feel like it was like one night of feeling really, really down, mm -hmm. and waking up the next morning and having this thought that it was like, "Oh wait, I love writing songs. Mm -hmm. I love singing songs, and now there's probably a whole world of music that I can." draw upon that that wasn't really stuff that would fit in with Jay's vision. So like the idea of the sound expanding really didn't occur to me until yeah. it was like presented in that way to me. When we come back after a quick break, in the wake of Uncle Tupelo's demise, Jeff creates a new band, Wilco, and a sound that is uniquely his own. Stay with us. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to The Great Creators. Hey. 
Hey, welcome back to The Great Creators. I'm Guy Raz. Here's more of my conversation with Jeff Tweedy. You mentioned that with the split of Uncle Tupelo, you, you came to this realization that, you know, wait, you know, like, well, I can I can try things I haven't been able to try. Um, and, and this is when Wilco happens, like right at, the, at this exact moment. Um, so wh- where did you go? Where did you go from there? Like, ha- how did you want to start? Like, how did you start to experiment with with what you wanted to sound like? Well, I think with the first record in such close proximity, time wise, yeah. to when Uncle Tupelo broke up, I still think I'm writing songs with um, the negative space of Jay's songs, yeah. kind of informing the songs that I'm writing and. And if I was an expansion at all of what I felt like we were, you know, we could do as a band, it was maybe entering into the power pop territory of the, of Big Star and mm. and things like that that mm. you know Jay and I both liked, but it yeah. wasn't it wasn't as um, a comfortable fit for Uncle Tupelo, and and it was definitely you know that. That world of guitar pop was really appealing to us in Wilco. Uh, on, and on the first record, I think that that's the thing that I thought was the most different from the sonic environment of Uncle Tupelo Records. Yeah. I was just listening to number one record in my car. I was playing <laughs> it with my kid. and um, Holds up. I think so, but of course they think it's boring dad music. And the only way to get it to be cool is if it's played on Stranger Things. So as we've learned from mm-hmm. Kate Bush <laughs> running up that hill. Yeah. Um, but what a great record. Um, mm-hmm. Did you, um, I mean, as you were sort of coming into this new sound, and I know the first record, as you mentioned, was very much, there was that Uncle Tupelo sound. Um, the, but the second record really... It, it was a break. It seemed like it was a break. And, and the song that I think about is Misunderstood, which is um, a very different sound. I mean, you are, um, I mean, it's almost like a little bit of a punk song in, in a sense. Um, do, you, do you agree with that? I mean, do you think I'm just, I don't know, it sound, does it sound right? Um, when AM came out, and even before AM came out, People at the record company literally said things to me like, this is going to be a great way to set up Jay's record, <laughs> you know, the Sunvolt record. And <laughs> and um, I was really being treated like the lesser part of a, a dismantled partnership. The press around the first record and things, you know, the reaction from fans was like, yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, it's, you know, pretty good for, you know, the bass player from Uncle Tupelo or something. You know, there's, there's a certain amount of dismissiveness yeah. uh, initially that made me feel like I don't want to do that again. I don't want to make music that is in in conversation with Jay Farrar anymore. I don't want to make yeah. I don't want to make music that is being weighed against Jay's music, you know, which is great. What and there was no reason to be in competition. But I just wanted to make a clean break and I started having maybe a certain amount of uh, just def- feeling of defiance about yeah. it. Maybe a little bit of anger, but more than anything, I just felt like, well, now there's no reason to not just draw upon every single thing that I've ever wanted to do. And so there was a liberation to just... Uh, Okay, if they're not going to accept me fitting into this world that I used to belong in, <laughs> yeah, um, then I might as well make a make a world for myself out of the the things that I love. Um, and the, as I say, the song I think of is misunderstood um, as an example of that. I wonder whether that is when you've had reactions like that throughout your career, and certainly at this point in your career. Um, I have to assume that you 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 struggle with self doubt at times that you thought maybe I'm just not that good at what I do. Oh, I think that you you should struggle with um, whether or not you're any good because I don't think that you get good without some doubt. I think I look at I look at my moments of doubt as as moments of 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 uh, growth or uh, like a, ch- a challenge. If yeah. I didn't if I didn't have those thoughts, I don't know. 
if I would ever feel challenged to get better, and I still like the idea that I'm getting better. I yeah. want to, I want to get better at it. And, um, uh, you know, the good thing is, is, is that I don't define myself and my self worth by whether people think my records are great or I even think that they're great. I define my self-worth by my family and my relationships with my friends and yeah. having people around me that that I can say, I, man, I suck, you know, <laughs> and, and them not even try and talk me out of it. Yeah. You know? but, <laughs> or, but, or, but I have to, you know. uh, sorry to interrupt, I have to assume that, that that was hard won because most of us do at some point in our lives define ourselves we go through a period where we define our, self, our, our, our self-worth based on what others think of us or what, how we're judged or the, our work. And you're doing very public work, right, as, as a musician. And, and, you know, you're putting it out there. And, and, and people can say or write or think things about it. And I have to imagine that had an effect on you. Um, I mean, there are times where I think I've used – like I said before, that dismissiveness or, you know, I, I, the hardest thing to ever take is, is pure, you know, indifference, you know, <laughs> someone ha taking the time to actually, you know, wholeheartedly hate something I've done. Yeah. That's a, that's a compliment. Um, indifference is, a, is, a, is definitely much more of a struggle to tolerate. Um, but, uh, I mean, they're never talking about me. They're never, you know, I mean, it's, they're, they're, they think they're writing about me or the record I made or the song that they're talking about, but um, they can only ever really write about themselves. They tell on themselves uh, um, in a lot of cases when, um, I don't know, it, it's just... It's fascinating to me more than it's like affecting. Yeah. Um, at this point in my life, and you know, I you can't find a single thing that has ever been released that somebody hasn't told somebody else that it sucks. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Oh. I mean, Beethoven, Beethoven got bad reviews. Beatles got bad reviews. Yeah. Bob Dylan's gotten bad reviews. I mean, it's it's it's. Uh, it's foolhardy to to weigh that with any anywhere near the same weight you you give yourself for enjoying having done it or or you know I love songs I've written I've loved listening to records I've made nobody can really shake that out I and mean, sometimes I shake it out of myself I just yeah. get sick of it or something like that and I also I've been doing it long enough to realize that that's just part of the process too you know I mentioned to you before we started the interview how Summer Teeth was was a record that really it was at a time in my life where I needed that record, I needed that in my life. Just you know, there's vulnerability, whatever whatever's going on, and it, and, and and I know that you hear that a lot, and that um, that record had um, just incredible songs on it, um, "Shot in the Arm" and and others. But the 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 album that really you know kind of changed everything of course was Yankee Hotel Foxtrot a lot of drama around that there's been a documentary made for people who don't know the story about how you were dropped by the label um, after you recorded that record and essentially put put it out with a uh, under a different label and it became a classic but did you in in the process of writing that record right it was it was so different it was and 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 it it had so many different elements and layers, and you worked with Jim O'Rourke and and others. Um, kind of walk me through. I know this is <laughs> hard to answer, and you've answered versions of this before, but kind of walk me through how you thought about making that record, even before you put pen to paper. Right now, just thinking about it, I I think that there's very similar feelings to what we've been discussing in terms of just dissatisfaction hmm. with my own my own abilities my own you know what I was able to draw out of myself musically and and a, as a band even just like the idea of, of our, our band 
feeling like not enough, not unique enough, not like not not rich enough hmm. musically. Where was that coming uh, from? Was that coming from you? A, a feeling that you had? Yeah, I think mostly. I think it was coming from other people's records challenging me. I like listening to and really diving deep into modern composition and mm. and and trying to wrap my head around things that I didn't have the musical vocabulary to kind of discuss, but I wanted to pursue because I felt like, why not? I felt audacious about it. Who were you listening to that, that you thought, God, they're just making music I, I'm not making. I'm not making as good of music. Like what, what bands, what albums? <laughs> well, I was listening to like Stravinsky and things okay. like that and <laughs> okay. like thinking, why can't I be that good? Um, you know, I was like discovering things, new ways of listening to things that I had heard, maybe even listening to them, not as not for my own enjoyment or not because I like it's just an interesting thing to listen to but listening to it and go what can I take from this I want this kind of depth to be a part of something I'm doing not that I want it to be academic or uh, it was like it was actually kind of the opposite it was kind of yeah. like hearing that music for the first time and going this isn't academic this is uh, contrary to what everybody maybe even says about some of it it is not without sentiment it is not an exercise uh there is i'm having a deep emotional reaction to it that can only come from music doing its work this way and how do i learn how to do that um within a context of a rock band and you know i'm still trying to figure that out but at the time it was like a really it was a real desire yeah i i yeah uh... I'm trying to imagine like, okay, we have to make something like Stravinsky <laughs> made. And and I think if that's your sort of – if that's what you're aiming for, I have to imagine that y y you still haven't – feel like you no, haven't of course done not. that. But, but, but that's like what you're aiming for, right? And so then you write – you start to write Yankee Hotel Foxtrot. You start to write songs like I'm Trying to Break Your Heart. If your standard is Stravinsky, how do you finish writing that song and say, yep, okay, we got it. We're there. This is good enough. Well, I didn't, and I I don't think you ever – you don't get – you know, the point isn't always to get, to nail the center of everything you aim for. The point is to aim for really, really lofty good things and, and know that you're going to end up somewhere different than you would have ended up if you hadn't aimed for that thing. You know, I, I, I think that – the point isn't to emulate, to get exactly at something, but without having that bar, that example, without absorbing other people's art, without finding and, and protecting and searching for that inspiration to show you where the bar is that you should be aiming for or to give you a, a new target, you don't really end up in very interesting places because... I think Yankee Hotel Foxtrot ended up being what it is because there were so many wrong turns. It's It ended up in so many other places than where I wanted it to go <laughs> that eventually it ended up somewhere where I looked was able to look around and go, wow, I've never been here before. I don't <laughs> know what this is. You know, this is an interesting, let's share this. Let's yeah. share this with the world because I don't think I've heard this record before. And that's that's a, 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 that was a learning process and it's a process that I've really tried to maintain as a as a core concept behind every record that I've made since. Is like you you want to you kind of want to get to the record that you haven't heard before. Mm. And it's not always easy. Um, you have varying degrees of success. And um but but the the it's important to 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 keep aiming for that i mean that 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 record would go on to be named you know best album of the year by several publications one of the best albums of the decade but how did you know cuz the the label dropped you they said this record is not going to do anything it's going to bankrupt our label uh reprise and uh so how did you know that it was or, – or did you? I loved it. 
I like I still love I still love it. My my bandmates loved it and my friends loved it. As hurtful as it was to be told that, um it it helped to have like I said before, to outlive my dreams by a long, long shot. You yeah. know, it didn't feel that scary to me. You know, I felt there was a uh, a buffer between me and a life that I couldn't tolerate. You yeah. know, I felt like I have this band. People come see us play. They're not going to just go away overnight because our label dropped us. You know, um, our band was built on live shows for the most part. And we'd never really relied upon record sales to keep us afloat. And so their role in what we were doing didn't feel, you know, necessary, <laughs> especially with the Internet becoming a part of the world where you could share music on the Internet and people were starting to be able to hear whole records that way. And we just thought. We'll just be a band without a record label. That seems doable. Lots of bands have n no record label. When that record came out and, and it achieved both commercial and critical success, did you ever hear from any of the executives from Reprise? Did, did anybody ever reach out and say, we screwed up, that was a mistake? No. In fact, recently, the because the record's anniversary right. uh, has resulted in a certain amount of think pieces about the record in different publications. I saw one of the executives interviewed about it, and <laughs> he's, his take on it was that he knew that this would happen and he did us a favor because they would have never given us the, you know, the they would have never given us the attention that it needed to do what it would do. Like it would never, they would have never worked hard enough to get it on the radio. Yeah. Kind of felt like um, hearing somebody say at somebody's wedding, "Yeah, you're, you know, I did you a favor by breaking up with you." <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm really the hero of this story. You yeah, know? right. Uh, but it, right. it's like, I mean, some people's egos are pretty well protected. Jeff, um, we we talked a earlier about the split with Jay and actually how that led both of you down different paths, and and he found success with Sunvolt, and and it enabled you to do things that you weren't able to do. And so, you know, sometimes like in the process of creating, there are going to be moments of, of, of incredible pain and, and making this record, you went through that too. Jay Bennett, who's your collaborator, there was a sort of a decision in the band that he was going to go. And I think you had to do that also for, for personal reasons, but also to, to continue to evolve maybe. Um, no, I mean, I, I definitely could see a scenario where, where Jay Bennett and I continued to work together and would have evolved musically and would have had enough music left in us to make together that would have been, um, enjoyable to pursue. But by the time Jay was asked to leave the band and, um, you know, the split happened with Jay, it was, it was just untenable as a relationship and and as a as a relationship with a with an entire band i think fundamentally jay became very enamored with a different part of the process than i than i did uh which was i think he embraced something that i i knew that i could not embrace and live very long which was the mythology of of rock music and the mythology of of that surrounds tortured genius and creating and mm -hmm. you know decisions weren't in my opinion weren't being made clearly to make the best work it was like kind of to to have the best story about how the work was made. <laughs> uh, you know, it was, it was just hard and distracting. And ultimately, I just I don't think that it, it contributed. Uh, you know, he contributed a lot to the record by the time, but by the time the record was being finished and he was being sort of isolated from the band, it was severely dis diminished by 
you know, a romantic idea of himself as a tortured, mad professor mm -hmm. in the studio um, that I, I don't think was good for him or us. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you were married, you were dad. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so, like, you weren't. It, I, I, from everything I know about you, you weren't attracted to that rock and roll, that sort of cliched rock and roll lifestyle, even though you were uh, at times struggled with addiction. Um, mm -hmm. But that wasn't what you were pursuing, that lifestyle. I, I mean, it's one of the things that I would tell myself to prevent myself from getting help. But so it was a double edged sword. But yeah, it wasn't uh, it wasn't what I was pursuing. And um it was repulsive to me, uh, honestly. I as like coming from a punk rock background or a smaller, you know, indie rock mindset. I thought that the the excess and of of uh, rock stardom was the enemy. <laughs> you know, it, it's like this theme in your in, in the evolution of your creative process is like, and it's it's not uncommon, but it's like it's like really uh what's a what's a word like just straining to get through break through like these moments of breakthrough that were really really hard um and i wonder how you like given that you are you've got stravinsky or whoever as this <laughs> you know this i don't know baseline right not baseline but this 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 thing that you aspire to mm -hmm. how how did you that's a lot of pressure, right? And so every lyric, I would think that in your mind, you're thinking every lyric, every word has to have meaning, have to, has to be profound. But that's impossible. You can't function like that because then you can't produce anything. If everything has to be perfect and profound, you can't produce anything. And so there has to be a point where you accept that what you're doing can't be perfect. And, and do you remember how you got to that, that point? Um, I read something when I was a uh, young, uh, um, maybe going to college and not really going to classes. I would hang out in the library and I was, you know, uh, like high minded and delusionally pursuing like the fringes of knowledge by being somewhat pretentious and maybe trying to absorb Gertrude Stein and 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 things like that and one of Gertrude Stein's essays is what makes a masterpiece and why are there so few of them and the concept that was introduced in that to me was the idea that no no artist is ever present for the creation of their masterpiece and <laughs> as as i've as I've gotten older and uh, my entire life, I've tried to make sense of that. And at some point, it it was pretty clear to me that I was doing that. Not that I was making masterpieces, but I was disappearing uh, in the process of making something. And that I was more often than not very pleased, the most pleased with things where my, my judging side, the side that you're talking about, the guy, the side that says, oh, everything has to be profound, everything has to be smart, everything has to display for the world how great you are. Yeah. Um, when that part of me is gone, um, I make stuff and hmm. and and I I can enjoy it and I can I can sound bad and I can sound good. I can write something I'm proud of and I can write something that I, I know I'm never going to want to share with anybody. But I kind of can't get to anything that I feel like has any lasting worth without going through the process of disappearing. And that's the only way that I know to get the least helpful member of my being out of the picture, which yeah. is my ego. <laughs> Jeff, we have to let you go. Um, so I'm going to ask you one last question. Um, in in your process, I mean, you've got this new record out um, now, uh, which is a great record, uh, Cruel Country. And you. you've written a book about songwriting, which is an incredible book. You also have a memoir out um, that came out a few years ago. When, when you think about the creative process, just writ large, you know, anybody trying to be creative – and you apply it to the way you think about it. Is it is it something that just kind of magically appears 
that some people kind of it lands on some people, or do you think it's it's something that you can mine, that you can find, that you can seek out if you just do the reps and just grind away? I am of the belief that it is something accessible to everyone, and I I base that on the the notion that if people weren't able to improvise, they wouldn't be able to find their way home uh, a lot of times. So, like they wouldn't be able to have conversations with other people.、Uh, we all improvise all day long. The difference for a、uh, creative practice is to. Do that intentionally、uh, to find a way to spend time with your imagination on a daily basis with intent.、Uh, not intent, not the intention to get famous, not the intention to make something that you can sell, not the intention to、uh, show off to the world again how smart you are, but just for the sake of spending time with your imagination and reminding yourself that you can make something that wasn't there when you woke up. And when you can make something that wasn't there when you woke up, you go to bed feeling、uh, like a creator. Yeah, and that is a incredibly powerful thing that everybody walks around with. And I refuse to believe that there that it isn't accessible to everyone to go to bed feeling like they made something that wasn't there when they woke up. That's Jeff Tweedy. By the way, Jeff has a new book out. His third. It's called "World Within a Song: Music That Changed My Life and Life That Changed My Music." In it, he explores 50 songs that have had an impact on his life, including some of his own. We'll link to where you can get the book, as well as other links, at thegreatcreators.com/tweedy. We have show notes for all of our episodes at thegreatcreators.com. Hey! Thanks so much for listening to the show this week. Please be sure to click the follow button on your podcast app so you don't miss any new episodes. And as always, it is absolutely free. This episode was produced by Michael May and edited by Jeff Rogers. Thanks also to Kevin Leahy, Elaine Coates, Rebecca Spiro, Jenna Gedman, Nat Hoops, and Daniel Shukin. I'm Guy Raz, and you've been listening to the Great Creators from Built It Productions. <laughs>